problems that we find something about it. Great. Um, yeah, come up here. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for coming here. Thanks so much for us to be able to talk to you. And if you could um, first maybe introduce yourself and your organization, as possible. My name is Alain de Cagnon. I am the leader of the indigenous people of the Afro. It is not an organization per se, it is a movement of a nation to try to exercise their God-given right to self-determination. As recognized by every civilized institution around the world, including the UN and the African Charter, even the Constitution of Nigeria itself as well, um, acknowledges that people do have a right to seek self-determination, and that's exactly what we're seeking to take from um, advantage of. Right. Very peaceful movement, I uh, think it's well. um, It is a non-violent movement, we don't believe in violence. Entirely peaceful, we agitate, we protest, we organize rallies, and um, we talk to people. That's all that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we've endured quite a lot from the Nigerian government. We are still enduring those um, forms of brutality against our people up until this very morning. They are still killing, they are still pillaging, they are still raping our women. But we have remained on the side of nonviolence uh, because we feel that that is the best way to go. I could imagine that it's a difficult decision to take because in the long run it's, it's, it helps you to achieve your goal, but I could understand if some people say, no, we have to stop too much. We have every right to fight back. It's very, very frustrating that we are inspired by the struggles and the successes of the likes of Martin Luther King and Mahatma um, Gandhi in India, and we believe that although the temptation to fight with force to fight evil with evil, um, coming from a very civilized people, um, as we are in Zara, we would not demean ourselves by um, stooping to the level of the aggressor. So we intend to continue to speak to organizations around the world like the good selves, to begin to make and consistently make the case for Biafra. We are not against anybody. We are not about to emasculate any kind of interest. We are to try and do something that hasn't been done before. All we are trying to say is that the way that Nigeria, as a microcosm of what Africa has come to represent, is structured, there is no way you can possibly extract any meaningful human existence from the present arrangement you have in Nigeria and by implication across Africa as a whole. So the best way for us to go is to try to return to how we were before the colonial, artificial colonial borders were thrown up. Exactly what Germany fought here in, um, in late 80s towards early 90s. As I quite, um, as I've argued on a few occasions, the um, Coming down of the Berlin Wall is the German version of self-determination. The clash of ideologies between socialism and, and capitalism made it impossible for the great German people to be together as a nation. I want Germans to also understand that that is exactly what is happening to us in Africa today, and especially in Nigeria. What we are having is our own version of the Berlin Wall. And the best way to get, try and get rid of that is by allowing reason, logic, and common sense to prevail, and not by going to war. And we don't intend to go to war. Mm -hmm. What are the means that the Nigerian government, governments, successive governments, have used in order to suppress human rights for Biafrans, self-determination for Biafrans? A comprehensive and wholesale economic, social, and political emasculation of our people. It may surprise you to know that Biafra is in the main a coastal region, a coastal nation. Prior to the war, we had about three functioning viable seaports. I just want to break this, our suffering down so that Americans can understand it. We are not agitating for Biafra for the sake of it. 
we are doing it because the political, economic, and social arrangement we unfortunately find ourselves in within Nigeria is unworkable for us. But Harcourt Seaport is not working. Calabar Seaport is not working. Wari Seaport is not working. Now there is huge congestion at the proper work in Lagos. But instead of the Nigerian government to open Wari Seaport, but Harcourt Seaport and Calabar Seaport, they have now decided to build two brand new additional seaports in Lagos, rather than open the ones in Biafra. You may also be aware of the fact in the recent economic elections that the Afrans were prevented from voting in Lagos, in Abuja, and in Kano. These are well documented by the observers that were sent by the European Union. There has been no notice of admonition. Nigerian governments have not been called or held to account as to why citizens of a particular country supposedly were not allowed to vote. I'll give you a simple example again in Germany. You have a lot of people who are German citizens that by that have Turkish um, um, either parents or grandparents that is from the from, from, from the Turkish uh, migrants into Germany after the Second World War. It is tantamount to saying to them that you will not vote in Bavaria. You will not vote in, say, in Hamburg. You will not vote in Cologne because you are Turkish. Do you see such a thing happening in Germany? Mm -hmm. But that is what is happening in Nigeria. And nobody is talking about it. When it comes to police brutality, military occupation, extortion, rape, pillaging, kidnapping, all forms of what I call of banditry by all the security arms and Nigerian government, all things we encounter and witness on a daily basis. All we do is we catalog them, we forward them to the likes of the organization, to the UN, to the EU, and nothing happens. So the status quo that you have in Nigeria or those supporting the status quo in Nigeria, which is the preservance of the present political structure in Nigeria will lead to the extinction of my people. Who benefits from the current structure? I think the colonial masters benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And also those whose interest it serves to ensure that Africa remains perpetually poor and subservient to the powers that be around the world. You may also know that there is a great race in Africa right now, a new form of brand of colonialism with the Chinese coming in and perhaps the Americans trying to stop them by also engaging a few governments in Africa as well. I am not against economic investment in Africa. I'm not against the economic participation of very powerful nations in Africa. In fact, I welcome it. I am a capitalist. I believe in laissez-faire economics. I want to come to Africa to invest in great jobs and opportunities for everyone. But there has to be a recognition that the arrangement that we or some of our fathers inherited after colonialism is unworkable, has never worked, and will never ever work. That is why no single black African country is proud of its record. No single black African country is developing in the right sense of the word development. All of them are dependent on handouts from Europe, from America, from the Middle East. And there is a reason for that. The reason for that is that coming together of divergent value systems is the key problem that we have. Allow me to once again reference Germany. There is um, a debate within the EU to allow Turkey to become a part of the EU. They've been applying for years and lobbying to become part of the EU. Although they are part of UEFA, you have Galatasaray, you have um, all the great football clubs from Turkey playing 
Michael Jordan mm. uh, or the UEFA uh, um, Champions League. But yet, Turkey is not a part of the EU, and there's a reason for that, a very valuable one. The reason being that the money system, which is the way you understand as a group of people, the way you, you distill issues, the way you solve them, the way you resolve them, is who you are as a people. We all know it's called value system. The value system of an Islamic Turkish state cannot sync with what you have in Western Europe as encapsulated in the EU. Mm -hmm. In other words, to fit Turkey within the EU will lead to a lot of cultural clash and upheaval. So the next thing to do is to allow Turkey to stay where it is that it prevent friends with you. But if you are seeking similar union with, say, Canada or the USA, it will be far more easier to achieve because they are all Judeo-Christians, they have democratic values, they believe in human rights, they believe in having an open society, they believe in the rule of law. This is what binds Europe together as presently constituted. Now, if you come to Nigeria, for instance, the northern part of Nigeria, they're mostly feudal Islamic emirates. In the west, the Yorubas, educated, sophisticated than they, they're more monarchical in their outlook. We Easterners, we Biafrans, are Republicans by nature. So having a state or a nation like Nigeria is like um, lumping United States of America, Iran, and Afghanistan to one country. And everybody knows it can never ever work. Mm -hmm. So that is the difficulty that most academics and scholars have failed to grapple with. That the present state structure in Africa is an impediment, a natural impediment to development, to growth, to the building of a similar society in Africa. And no part of black Africa will be civilized until these core issues are addressed. What do you say to those people who say that new countries mean new conflicts? New countries or the new more movement for self-determination, yes. for independence, yes. lead to more clashes between different ethnic and religious groups? The same argument was made before the collapse of the Soviet Union. The same argument was also made before Yugoslavia was dissolved, and to a lesser extent Serbia as well. You will recall and agree with me that the Soviet Union was a nuclear power, isn't it? Was there a nuclear war when the Soviet Union broke up? Yugoslavia, to an extent, the same. There was the, the, that fear or paranoia about the Balkans, you know, the, the ripple effect it will have on the border. Yugoslavia be allowed to break up. Yugoslavia broke up. New emerging democracies came out as a result of it. Is there any war in Yugoslavia today? Not today, no. Exactly. There are legacies of the wars in the 90s, but absolutely. But it did subside after a while. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same thing in Africa. Mm -hmm. It can be done in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's inverted racialism, that's what I call it. It's racism by another means. To think that Europe can handle the disintegration of the mighty empire like the Soviet Union, that you don't expect Africans to manage their own disintegration. I don't think that is correct at all. You will also agree with me that Ethiopia, literally from Ethiopia, and very recently, um, of course, the, the history is not about the current in southern Sudan came out of Sudan. Right. And um, it's a case of how they we are managed more than anything else. If there is a recognition that the primacy of the will of the people at all times should be allowed to prevail, then there won't be any issues at all. Mm -hmm. And let's assume that uh, the Biafrans will become an independent state, will get their freedom after all. Um, how do you envision the relations between born Biafra and Nigeria. What's your vision for that? My vision would be the same 
relationship that USA have been in. After all, the United States of America fought for independence and conflict, for that matter, and broke away from the British Empire. And today, they call themselves cousins that lives across the pond. The same will happen with us. We were not at war before the British came to colonize us, and we will not be at war when Africa is separated. There seems to be this fear that the reason why we seek the air is because of the huge oil and gas deposits we have in the air. That's not the case. We just want to live like any other civilized, normal country around the world. We don't want to come to Germany to seek asylum. We don't want to drown in the Mediterranean. We don't want to spread thousands of kilometers. Uh, across the Sahara Desert to die of dehydration. We don't want to be labeled as victims. We just want to live an ordinary, dignified life. You want to be the masters of your own fate? Absolutely, which any normal human being will aspire to have. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you tell us something about your own personal history. You were born in 1967. That is correct. Yes. The Biafran War had already begun. Yes. Um, do you remember anything from your first years on mm, Earth? Not actually, no. I, the, I don't know how it managed to happen because all I can recall was the... For those first three years, no, I can't recall anything at all. Mm -hmm. I know I had doting and loving parents. Mm -hmm. That's all I can recall from Italy. It dawned on me when uh, about the age of five, the Nigerian soldiers ransacked my village and um, destroyed the properties and took most of the men away because a wrong Fulani soldier molested one of our sisters and she retaliated. She spawned his advances and Shot me away basically, and I was in my village was sealed up, and um, that, that was my very first conscious experience of what it means to be in Nigeria. The raiding of my village and the arrest and detention of our fathers and, and our uncles and our brothers. Then, because somebody wanted to raid my sister, and she said, My aunt actually, and she said, No. So you can imagine. And we had to live with that, with that occupation for a very long time. Uh, but it seems to me that the more it went on, the more the world forgot. It's like Biafra was one of those um, traumas that the world wanted to forget about. And that was, that's why we're here today. And until today, there has not been any national reckoning, not any, any reckoning, any kind of reckoning, any form of reckoning with regards to the Biafra. Crimes that were committed, it's not being talked about in Nigeria. No, because I believe that the powers that be around the world doesn't want to talk about it for reasons best known to them. Um, a lot of people died. 3.5 million people, apart from the Jews of Europe, were the second largest genocide in modern history. There was a conscious effort to sweep the whole thing under the carpet. Like it never happened. But for some reason, we may also ourselves be guilty of that because we did not do what we're now doing. We did not um, raise the awareness and highlight the point. So we also have to show up and blame as well. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a you were criticized <coughs> in a very young age. Yes. You told us about the rumors you had of years old. Yes. Um, could you tell us something about how you were politicized um, in subsequent years? In subsequent years, that very experience that I had as a child stuck with me. And as time went on, we realized that Nigeria didn't want us to be there with them. They wanted us there as slaves, perhaps. So that <coughs> people they can explore people who are who will be made to subservient to the powers that be. But as time went on it became harder. 
we paid school fees to go to school. Others don't pay school fees. Others did not pay school fees. There's something called, as the president of this called the educationally disadvantaged states in Nigeria. Which means that if I score 200 out of, say, 400 to go to a school, I will not gain admission or entry to that very school. If somebody else from somewhere who is full of our house and scores only three out of 400, <laughs> they will get a prize. Had to start from scratch at the war. Um, we were only given 20 pounds per family, per male, adult, child. Regardless of how much you had in the bank before the war, immediately after the war, all that money was confiscated by the Nigerian state and only 20 pounds given to you. Just that, like that. Mm. that is why. Today, you have us in, in the business of buying and selling rather than manufacturing and, and, and goods of, of goods and services. The <coughs> discrimination is not subtle anymore, very consistent and sustained, culminating only recently in the Nigerian government or those in charge of Nigeria telling us that we can't vote in certain states, that an evil man in Biafra can no longer be the president of Nigeria. This is for the Nigerian state. It is not something that happened at a particular time. It is as an accumulation of a series of um, very distressing and disturbing developments within Nigeria that led some of us to say that enough is enough. And we are not going to stop. Mm. Um, you told us before that you agreed the yeah. Yes. It was 29 years ago when you went to London, or was it even before? No, 29 years ago. Mm. Could you tell us about the circumstances of you having to do it? I fled Nigeria when I was released from prison. The Nigerian state. On the 14th of September 2017. When I was due in court the next month, October the 13th, they came to kill me on the 14th and they ended up killing me to leave me in the mm. Now you would have thought in any other place around the world there would be some kind of an inquiry or some kind of um, judicial review as to why somebody who was my record should be attacked with the sole intention of killing them. Mm. None of that happened in my case. What they wanted to do was to kill me because they know the work has to do with Biafra. Nobody gives a toss about it. You can walk into Biafra today and kill a million people. I can assure you nothing will happen to you. So they came to my house, they became emboldened because they killed Biafra so many times that questions were not being asked. So they, they, they thought, you know, you are killing <clears throat> And that nobody will ask questions. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I was basically bundled out of my house by my security men, but unfortunately 28 of them fell in the process. And I made my way to Israel. Israel and that's exactly what happened. They came to kill me. And when I can pass that in levy war against the state, absolutely nothing. But because the full and ruling class in Nigeria, because they know that they have the backing of the Islamic world and by extension Britain, they can do whatever thing they like to anybody and nothing will come of it. That's the type of life we are being for the deal in Nigeria. Can you tell us something about your relationship with the state of Israel? I am a Jew, not just myself, but you know, 
my people. We are uh, most of the Jewish traditions we practice. We are mutualists, basically. And um, so it's a question of um, I think is um, the journey of um, discovery. When you discover yourself and know where you come from, and you can do all you can to be very proud of that, of that very heritage and identity. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So we've been this way for centuries. This is how we were born. So and make no apologies about that. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And today, how does the Nigerian government portray its policies towards the people of Biafra to the outside? The outside world, I think, is a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy to perhaps kill every Biafran on the face of the earth, erase Biafran people. Because Nigeria has a lot of money they get from food, oil, and gas from my land. From my <coughs> and they have well defined lobbies around the world, including here in Germany, for instance. So when you present the case of Biafra before the German foreign ministry, what they tell you is that, oh, we are doing the best we can to make sure that Nigeria lives up to its obligations to respect human rights and to have value for the life of its citizens. That's all. We support the territory of here. And for that very reason, all we can do is advise my Nigerian government. And the impunity continues. The policy of the EU of great countries like Germany and Britain is to encourage dictatorship in Africa. And impunity. The close with the reason that we don't want to destabilize the West African sub-region, Nigeria is Power Nigeria is um, has a great population. We don't want to disrupt or you know upset the outcast. That's what they're saying in effect. We just need a here or there to hold Nigerian government to account. Doesn't require complex politicking or diplomatic maneuvering. All it does is very simple. You either do this or here are the consequences of your action. But they have failed to do that time and time again. That is why people are dying on a daily basis. That is why the killings are continuing now. And it's even grown from the Biafran territories into the Middle Belt and to the North. When they kill and nobody does anything about it, it emboldens them and they kill even more. And the kid, as I'm speaking to you right now, now, if you go online and type in killings in Nigeria, you will see the ones that happened this very afternoon. And all the world does is to turn the blind eye. And if that's them, they tell you because we don't want to upset that part of the world. I want to actually know what they are defending. Because an independent Biafra will do business with every right thinking civilized country around. If the idea is for the European civilized world to say we want to promote human rights, we want the, the main goal to be achieved in terms of development, drinking water, housing, education, all the rest of it, the best way to do that is to be on its own. That Southeast Asia is developing today because of Japan. Europe is where it is today because of the healthy competition between the likes of Germany and France, the UK, and all the rest of it. Why wouldn't they allow Biafra to have this? There is this conspiracy that perhaps when Biafra comes, who knows? You have Africans that are really perhaps some And you know that Biafra can solve that very problem. But they refuse to be into that. 
because those that drew up the boundaries in Africa want to maintain it. Give me the majority. They, they are playing God. You know, we are God. We went to Africa. We created Nigeria. We created the Cameroons. Ghana is ours. But I keep asking. Why was it that when the Soviet Union came into Germany and decided to divide Germany into two by building the Berlin Wall, why was it that NATO, Western Europe, and North America said no, or at least fought until those barriers came down? Maybe you have a lot of leaders, people that love their people. In Africa, you have heads of state who are more interested in how fast they're switching back on field than trying to elevate the soul of the people. So, in that regard, I'm not blaming, uh, uh, the, the blame is not entirely on Europe and America. I think we also have a loss to us all. We have not behaved like human beings should. Most black Africans, I'm sorry to say, There's not much difference between us and the wild beasts in the forest. I'm being very, very particular and honest about this. The problem can be laid on the doorstep of Europe or America. We are also responsible. We have failed to reason properly like human beings. That is Going to ask him how come you do the elections. All the bloodshed. People were killed, mowed down in polling stations. You saw them burn polling, polling boots down, including the ballot papers. Have you heard of any national inquiry? Any condemnation anywhere? Mm -hmm. Because all the big boys, they have oil and gas interests. They don't want to destroy us. You know, these monkeys can die all the life. I mean, we don't need our oil and gas. And that's exactly what dictates their reasoning. Right. So your point would also be that the civil societies in Western countries need to wake up and put more pressure on their politicians to change their tactic towards Nigeria. Yes, in the ideal world. I think most of the civil societies in the world. But within a wider context, nothing is happening in Africa. CNN won't cover it. That's a Sky won't cover it. Sky News won't cover it. You can watch Sky News from year to year. There will be no mention of anything in terms of human rights abuses happening in Africa on their platform. Al Jazeera the same. But when anything happens to a Muslim,
something similar could also happen in Nigeria or that it might give any power or help to the Biafran movement? Yes, but only within the meaning of the true understanding of what a nation should be. Isn't it very ironic that when Southern Sudan was part of Sudan, this uprising never happened? It's only happening now because now you have more a more homogeneous Islamic almost um, Arabic in coloration population. They now have the right to decide who governs. In Nigeria, if Nigeria were to divide into three core, we can now hold our leaders accountable. But having this amorphous um, 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 sort of congregation of diverse nationalities, all you need to do is to play on the ethnic card in terms of these people. So you can be the worst dictator in the world, and nobody will remove you. Mm -hmm. Because you will say, you're not going to That's what happens in Africa. That's why you want to see in Africa. Most political scientists don't even know. But in terms, look at the removal on all the Arab Springs happened in Africa, where there were predominantly one existing order, be it religious, be it political, be it social. They had one thing in common. They had pockets of um, other faiths and religions and people, but in the main, the overarching religion was Islam. So their value system was Islamic. You can rise up against the ruler of the state, and people understand you. If I rise up now in Nigeria to fight against that thing that they have there as their president, that that group of Sudan, they will say because they're practicing Jew. He doesn't like us. We are Muslims. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if they had their own country, Muslims, governing Muslims, against your leader, and nobody will complain. Mm -hmm. That is one of the lasting damages that the arbitrary creation of national states in Africa is having on our people. You can never have a revolution, a popular uprising in black Africa, never, ever, ever, with the current and existing boundary structure you have in Africa. It's impossible. Forget it. And without popular uprising, how can you change anything? Mm. Society. So many people would say that uh, the existing borders are sort of a difficult, to say the least, legacy, but they ensure some kind of stability. And you would say that as long as this goes on, there won't be any stability in the world. Was, there, was this overriding concern for stability so prominent when communism was collapsing across Eastern Europe? Why didn't the powers that be say, no, if we collapse communism, there will be so much stability with some nuclear warheads in Kazakhstan, some in Georgia, some in Azerbaijan. There will be difficulties across the world, or there will be this nuclear um, apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Countries that had nuclear weapons broke into pieces. There was no nuclear war. Anybody pointing out or using stability as an excuse to maintain these very decaying and evil regimes you have in Black Africa, that person is worse than Satan. It's evil. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. An absolute lie. A rich friend from Ethiopia. Has the war ended? Has Africa collapsed? Southern Sudan came from Sudan itself. Has the world come to an end? Why is it that when it comes to America, the rules always change? Why is that? That is my main concern. Allow us to grow organically the same way that states are formed in Europe. How can I come from Biafra and I come to Germany and I caught you into seven places and say, you, 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 from today your name is Westphalia? You're Bavaria, you're no longer German. Does that make any sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. Why must you be allowed to endure 
maybe because we are Africans, we don't ask questions, and we are perhaps very stupid, I don't know. So, assume, let's be optimistic, assume that one day you will be able to return to the Africa yes. after such a long time. After now, now 29 years. Yes. What's the first thing that you do? First thing that I would do is to go and pray at the temple where our forefathers used to play, pray in a place called Arutubu. A very glorious temple described by the British in 1904. I'll go back there and pray. I think that's the first thing that I will do. And, um, and I'll watch a crop of new leaders emerge to take Biafra to its rightful position in Africa. I won't say the world. If I say the world, they will say black people from Africa feeling very well, going to school. No famine, no difficulties. I don't think that some parts of Europe can live with that. Uh, uh, there is a part, I believe, in an average European that actually enjoys the suffering and misery in Africa. I'm being honest with you. Mm. There could be a, uh, an insignificant minority uh, that have the, 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 the sense of fair play within them that would like to see Africa emerge from the mess that is in today. I can tell you categorically that uh, I believe some of them that donate money to charity may be so out of some kind of pity that you know these creatures can't and will never take care of themselves. I want to be alive to watch Biafra emerge from that stereotype and become something that is there today. And the world has nothing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. For having, talking to us and letting our, our viewers.